I feel like there's fewer and fewer of us, like every every morning, people come in late. Well, we'll have a few more, hopefully. But uh, I can't believe that it's already, like, we're already a week into October. Like, my first eight-week class has already ended. We're past the halfway point of the semester, which is just wild. Wow. It's like it's going really fast. Does it feel fast to all of you? Right? It feels quick. Like, I wanted to slow down. I love October, and I feel like it's flying flying by so quickly. It's like, no, slow down. I haven't had nearly enough candy yet for it being October. <laughs> it's my candy month. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the second part of the paper, but I'm going to do that at the end today. You have like a week and a half, but I want to start talking about it so it's on your mind. Um, otherwise, we'll jump back into where we were last time. I also want to let you know, we were supposed to have a guest speaker on Wednesday to talk about QPR, uh, but they had to reschedule or at least they're they're letting me know if they have to reschedule. So most likely it won't be Wednesday, which means we might go a little bit out of order while we wait for them to come in. Um, really awesome that they typically come in, you get like a little certificate for completing it, which you can put on a resume. But uh, I will let you know when I know that they are coming, they're still kind of trying to figure that out. So uh, we will finish up, probably finish up mood disorders today and then either have that or move on to eating disorders on Wednesday. Right. And I'm sorry I wasn't here last Wednesday. My three kids, I was saying, my kids are sick. And I'm like, they keep like coughing on me. I like, stay away. I feel so mean. I'm like, give me space. Because my, um, the, like two out of three of them are sick. And the second they get sick, it's like we're doomed. So I'm like knocking on wood and trying very hard to stay safe and not sick. But uh, for now, I'm okay. But they are sick. So that makes my life complicated. But anyway, uh, we'll go back into where we left off. We were talking a lot about antidepressants last time, right? So we talked about how depression has a lot of biological factors to it that tend to cause it, and therefore a lot of biological treatments, right? So we talked about these four different types of or like groups of medication, the two ones at the top being older, the two ones at the bottom being newer and more commonly used. So again, the SSRIs and the SNRIs are really the most popular groups of antidepressants, right? We almost never use the other ones. They're really old and outdated. And the two bottom ones are much, much better. But as we were talking about last time, like every single one of these has side effects that come with them. Any drug that you take is gonna have a side effect. Even something as mild as caffeine, uh, which I've already had, and I see some of you with right this morning, like caffeine is something very mild. But even something like that can cause you to feel like anxious or jittery or have a hard time sleeping. Everybody reacts very differently to drugs and to medication. Um, and I have a, a, an example of just I typed in antidepressants in YouTube. And the first one that came up was Cymbalta. And Cymbalta is a very commonly used medication. It's one that we see um, a lot. It's an example of an SNRI. So a little bit more uh, than the SSRIs, but a pretty commonly used drug. Now, whenever they advertise a medication, they are legally required to share the side effects with you, right? They have to, by law, uh, share the side effects. And I don't know if you've ever taken a moment to consciously listen to the side effects, but it's a lot, right? And so I found one random like Cymbalta commercial, and I'm sure some of you have seen it. I've seen it on TV before, uh, but I'll play this for you. And I want you to just mindfully listen to all of the side effects that they list. Now, I'm in no way saying that these medications aren't helpful. They are life changers for people, but just be aware and listen to the side effects. It's kind of shocking if you give it the time and attention. Um, so let me pause the recording here and I'll play it for you, You're right? Um, but still, like there's so many things and some of those are really common, right? Like headaches and stomach aches and dizziness. Those are really common things where they talk about like fatal liver issues and blisters and hives. Like there's a ton of things that can happen when you take these medications. They also, um, and I think it was in the video I played for you last time, talk about serotonin syndrome, which is something that people can get. When you affect serotonin, sometimes you can go too far and people get flooded with serotonin and can cause what's called serotonin syndrome. And it can actually be fatal. It drives your blood pressure like up through the roof. Uh, people end up in the hospital for it. They can have seizures because of it. So it's this constant balancing act between, you know, is this going to help me? And can I tolerate the side effects? Because a lot of people can't tolerate the side effects of antidepressants and they have to consider other options. Yeah. I feel like I just 
too on topic, but I started the meditation and I was like cleaning my room yesterday. And you know how you always got like a big like packet with like meditation or you some like if it's antibiotics or something? Yeah. Sure. But I was uh like gonna throw it out, but I was like just out of curiosity, like let me look for it. Yeah. And it was just like pages and pages of like yeah, seizures, like, right. like the first week don't even drive, like don't this, it could blur your vision, it could like uh it could cause like high blood pressure without your doctor you're on it. But I was just like, Oh my god. <laughs> and it just kept going and going and going and yeah. and stop it, it's happened, don't like do alcohol and all the other mm -hmm. It's overwhelming, right? And you're like, okay, but I just yeah. needed, you know. Yeah. And they have to legally give you all that, right? And yeah. and the odds of like all the severe stuff is low, but it's not zero, right? Like it's always like that TikTok, right? The odds of your cat killing you are, are like low, but it's never zero, right? Like it, it's just it's possible, right? And so you have to be really aware of that. And what'll happen, and I think I mentioned this last time, when you go to go on a medication you start at a really low dose, right? So let's say that you're going on Cymbalta that we just watched. You would take one like smaller dosage of it for like a week and you see how you tolerate that. And after a week, maybe two, if you've tolerated that, then we go up to another level. And if you tolerate that, then another. And after like six to eight weeks, you get up to the clinical dosage that might help you with your depression. So after like eight weeks or so, if you haven't seen any changes in your mood, that, that medication, that Cymbalta might not help you. Now, along the way in those eight weeks, you're experiencing those side effects. And for some people, they can't even make it to eight weeks because the side effects are so disrupted, right? And so let's say you go on this because you're struggling with depression. One of the first things they said is this could make your depression worse and cause suicidality, especially in younger people, right? So in teenagers and young adults who go on these medications, it's not uncommon for them to launch your depression and make it worse. Right. And so after eight weeks of building up to it, if it doesn't work, then you take another three to four weeks to get off of it slowly, because like you were just saying, you can't just stop it suddenly. Right. And so you're talking about maybe three months in total from when you start a medication to see if it works or maybe even go off of it to then try another one. Right? And so this can be so much trial and error for people. But when you find the right one, it's life changing. Right. So if you're able to find one that works for you, you can tolerate the side effects tends to be fantastic. But some people can't tolerate these. Right. And that's not actually that uncommon. Right. Because of the side effect profiles. A lot of you said you knew people who have been on these. I mean, any other like stories or comments or questions or thoughts or anything else about antidepressants? Anything else at all here? Uh, I have some other like approaches then that I want to share with you. Uh, things, if antidepressants don't work, there are other things that people can do, right? So there are brain stimulation methods that we'll talk about, but there's also one other thing that's growing in popularity. And I imagine some of you have heard of it, but ketamine. Now, when you hear the word ketamine, I don't know if you, I think of Matthew Perry, like right off the bat, right? Like that's the first thing that comes to my mind because he died of an overdose of ketamine. Uh, but ketamine is something that is starting to gain a lot of popularity when it comes to treating depression. Now, ketamine therapy has been around for a long time, but what they do is they give you a very low dose of ketamine in the form of a nasal spray. Some places do it as like an IV injection but it's typically a nasal spray um, and you take a small dosage of it. And what happens is it causes you to have like a dissociated like experience, if you will. Right. So this is um, ketamine is what's considered like an anesthetic medication. And so when you take it, you take this nasal spray, they administer it to you with your psychiatrist or with the doctor who's doing it. And then you sit there for two hours in like a quiet room that they sometimes call a Zen room and somebody supervises you while you go on a dissociative trip, right? So in a way, it's, it's a very controlled substance. You have to have FDA approval to do this. It has to be approved by a psychiatrist. But typically, people will go into this dissociated state. But it's not that trip or that state that actually is what's helping you. It's the way that ketamine affects your glutamate receptors. So glutamate is one of the like other neurotransmitters that tends to play a role in depression. 
it's thought to almost like increase the synaptic connections that you have in your brain. And it increases the amount of glutamate, which then affects norepinephrine, serotonin, and dopamine. So it's kind of an indirect effect. But the interesting thing about ketamine, and again, this is kind of like an atypical thing that some people will, will pursue if they can't tolerate medications, is that it can actually help in just one treatment. Right? So somebody might go in to receive one treatment and feel drastically better after just one treatment. So rather than waiting like six to eight weeks or like two to three months, people who go in for ketamine therapy might feel better instantly. Now, there are a lot of side effects and it can lead to other issues. Like sometimes people get addicted to ketamine. Um, there are like sometimes consequences for those dissociative trips. They can be scary for people. But in a couple of sessions, this can sometimes reset people's brain in a very quick way in contrast to antidepressants. So just something that's kind of growing in popularity. It's been around a long time, but it is now FDA approved to treat depression and something that you might occasionally hear about. So if ketamine or if antidepressants don't work, sometimes we consider brain stimulation methods. Now, this sounds scary, right? Like we're going to go in and stimulate your brain through a variety of methods. Um, some of these are better than others. The first one up here, electroconvulsive therapy, we talked about in, I think it was chapter one or, or two, chapter two. Electroconvulsive therapy is the old standby. ECT is what it's called. Right? I remember I played you that clip from One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest where Jack Nicholson's character gets this treatment. What they do in this is they cause you to have a massive seizure. A clonic seizure is what it's called, clonic seizure, and you would lose consciousness for a matter of like two seconds. And something about that like loss of consciousness, that massive jolt of energy to your brain, is thought to activate that brain like um, circuit that we talked about and help alleviate depression. Now, what happens is this like process is it's thought to be helpful for activating the region of the brain, but it's not a one time thing. You go over the course of like typically almost 12 like treatments. So two to four weeks, you would go in and have this treatment done. You're typically sedated for it. They give you a medication to sedate you. It can lead to memory loss and like a lot of like disorientation, but it's thought to be really helpful. They've been doing this since like back in the 1930s it was the first time that we tried this with like a, a patient who had schizophrenia. And again, it tends to be helpful, but it's kind of getting old. We have a newer method and, and it's gaining a lot of like popularity and traction and that's called TMS. How many of you have heard of TMS before? Anybody? A few of you? Um, so TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation is the new way of doing brain stimulation. Now we still do ECT. And the reason that this isn't done all the time is because it's quite expensive. Now it's becoming more and more available for people. Insurance is starting to support it more and more because it shows a lot of improvement uh, in people who are severely depressed and unresponsive to medication. So what they do in TMS is they send targeted magnetic pulses to that region of your brain, that Broadman area 25. They send targeted pulses to that region trying to increase the activity to therefore increase serotonin. I have a video that shows you what this look like uh, looks like, and then we'll come back and talk about it more. But as I said, this is gaining a lot of like popularity and it doesn't hurt. Um, well, I will say it doesn't hurt a lot, right? The pulses are actually a little bit painful at times until you get used to them. Um, but once you get used to them, it's actually like a pretty mild procedure. You can drive yourself there. You can drive yourself home. With ketamine therapy, you actually can't drive for 24 hours afterwards. Right. And so this one's actually kind of invasive in the sense that it, it kind of wipes you out for the rest of the day and you have to have somebody drive you there and drive you home. So let me play this a uh, little kind of it's a company video that I found, but I think it explains it. Nicer. Um, and they put a little machine right above your head and it's not even necessarily like it, I guess it's, it is touching you, but it's just sitting there on top. And then what it does is it sends little pulses. It does like 20 pulses uh, in a little burst. Right, and then there's a matter of seconds in between and then 20 more pulses and 20 more. And you do this for a treatment time of anywhere from like 18 to 27 minutes. So you sit in a chair and you can like watch TV or listen to music or whatever. Um, and they do this repetitive pulse over and over and over again, which is why it's sometimes called repetitive TMS or RTMS. 
and it's thought to activate that little region of the brain. And as I mentioned, the pulses can actually be a little bit like um, uncomfortable as they radiate through your face. Uh, but after you've done a matter of these treatments, you get used to them and they're no longer as uncomfortable. And typically people go five days a week. So you go every single day, like Monday through Friday, uh, for like 30 something sessions. So it is definitely more intense in the sense that it's like 35 to 37 treatments, five days a week. But you can go there yourself. You can drive yourself home. Um, you're not in an altered state in any way. Versus like ketamine, for example, as I mentioned, might be only once or twice a week. But it is very impactful in the sense that you're done for the day and can't drive yourself back and forth. So uh, TMS is something that it has really gained a lot of popularity. There are a lot of places. We have one in Moore Park. There's a couple in Thousand Oaks. Uh, and there's a bunch of these places throughout our area. Um, and they're gaining a lot of traction in treating depression for people who can't respond or can't tolerate uh, antidepressants and, and so on. Any, any questions or thoughts? Anyone, anyone know someone who's done TMS, right? I, I know a couple of people who've done it, who've described it, but uh, any questions or stories or comments or anything? Mm -hmm. um, again, uh, being more and more supported five years ago, it would cost you $10,000 to do that round of like 30 something sessions. And now insurance covers it. So it's really come a long way in just like five to 10, five to 10 years. These two uh, aren't really practiced, but they are other methods. They're incredibly invasive and they're not all that successful. Really TMS is, is like now the new standard, but vagus nerve stimulation and deep brain stimulation, they implant little pacemakers and stimulators in your, um, in your chest and in your head, and they send pulses that way. Okay, really, really uncommon, especially DBS. Um, it's, it's very like kind of a risky procedure, um, but there are other things that have kind of been studied and tried. The first two are really by a mile, like the most popular and most used of them all. One other common like cause for depression is the cognitive perspective. So a lot of like biological stuff, quite a bit of biological stuff for depression, but it could also be due to negative thinking patterns. There's a lot of negative thinking that happens in depression. And if you've ever been depressed, it's very easy to get caught up in like these negative automatic thoughts. They pop up instantly. You have to check the facts and counter them and work hard to get rid of them. But it's very common that people with depression have what Aaron Beck called the cognitive triad of depression. Aaron Beck's a really famous like cognitive therapist who studied depression. He created something called the Beck Depression inventory or the BDI. And it's something that you take almost every single time that you go in to see a psychologist if you have a diagnosis of depression. It's this little scale that you take that evaluates how you're doing on like a very like concrete, um, in a concrete way. But he talked about this idea of the cognitive triad, that when people have depression, they have a negative view of themselves, a negative view of the world, and a negative view of the future. And if you have those three things, it tends to create these negative schemas that only fuel depression even more. And people who are depressed, these automatic thoughts, they just tend to run away a little bit. One little thing can become this huge global event, right? And all of a sudden it's hard to rein that back in. Like for example, like they have this little person um, like sitting here at like a desk, right? So let's say you take an exam in a class and you fail it. It happens. Maybe you didn't study enough. Maybe it was a bad test. Maybe some combo of the two, but you fail the test. Okay? The typical person might be like, oh, like that sucks. Like you're frustrated. You're angry. Maybe you even drop the class, right? It all kind of depends. But someone who has depression, it starts to snowball. So you get this like, oh, I failed the test. I'm not good at anything. I knew I could never pass this class. I'm stupid. Like I can't do anything right. It becomes this big global thing. And then you externalize it to the rest of the world, right? It's like my teacher thinks I'm stupid. My classmates think I'm stupid. My family thinks I'm stupid. I'm never going to pass this class, which means I'm never going to pass college. I'm never going to graduate. If I never graduate, I'll never get a good job. If I don't get a good job, I won't have any money. If I don't have any money, like I'm going to have a horrible life. No one's going to love me. I'm going to die alone, right? It just snowballs. 
right, from one test, right? And so maybe you don't pass the class or maybe you have to retake it, but it's probably not that whole huge thing that happens when you're depressed. And so a lot of treatment for like cognitive depression stuff is trying to rein those thoughts back in, right? Okay, so realistically, you failed this test. What does that mean? Sorry, um, what does that mean for you? Does it mean that your whole life is over? No, worst case, maybe you have to retake the class, okay? So it's a lot of like challenging those thoughts, but that triad really can interfere and cause a lot of issues um, that fuel somebody's depression. So kind of a combination of biological and cognitive stuff are the biggest culprits for for depression. Before we move on to a bipolar disorder, any other like questions, thoughts, comments, stories, anything, anything depression related before we move on? Okay. So the uh the other like big disorder in this chapter is bipolar disorder. And so remember, we talked about mood existing on two poles or two ends. There's the low end and the high end. You can have just depression, but if you have what's called a manic episode, then we would diagnose you with bipolar disorder. Bipolar disorder is a disorder where you alternate between periods of being really, really up, which we call mania, and periods of being really, really down, which we just covered and would call depression. And there's often a lot of normal mood in between. So people are kind of like up and down and up and down and up and down, and maybe have a lot of like normal typical in there too. And all of us go up and down, but the ups and downs are much more severe when people have things like bipolar disorder. Now, what we're adding here is a manic episode. So when people have a manic episode, You have to have a couple of different symptoms lasting at least a week. So for this, it's three plus symptoms lasting at least one week. So remember, the depressive episode is two weeks. This is only one week. But manic episodes tend to be really disruptive and even like dangerous for people. Oftentimes, people get themselves into trouble during a manic episode. They can have a lot of consequences. It's kind of one of the defining features of them. So some of the symptoms that you might have, people have inflated self-esteem. Now that might not sound so bad by itself. Like, oh, my self-esteem is high, right? Like, but it's like grandiose almost, the grandiosity. It's inflated without any reason for being inflated. So people have these like wild, like, unlimited hopes and schemes. I can accomplish all this. I'm going to do all these things. It's very like unchecked. Like you can do anything in a very like non-grounded kind of way. So people have this really high self-esteem or sometimes what we call grandiosity. People oftentimes don't sleep or sleep very little. During a manic episode, you have a hard time sleeping because you're so up and agitated. And so you might not sleep at all, or you only sleep like an hour or two or a very short period of time. You have uh, an increased like pressure to talk. So increased talking, sometimes even a pressure to talk. Like you can't stop. You're interrupting people. You can't stop talking. You have this pressure where you feel like you have to speak. Maybe you're speaking really, really quickly. That could be another way that it manifests. You have racing thoughts. Sometimes we call this flight of ideas. Your thoughts are kind of all over the place. Your thoughts are racing, right? Like it feels like your mind is going a million miles a minute. Again, some of these things are common for anyone, but it's it's affecting your life in some way. You're incredibly distracted. Really difficult to focus. That's another common element of this. Um, you have what's called psychomotor agitation. Right, a lot of like tapping, fidgeting, you can't sit still, you kind of go, 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 right? Um, and some of these things may be a little bit in common with things like ADHD, but again, you would look at the whole picture, right? Some of those symptoms overlap for sure. The biggest one and the one that gets people into trouble is you have like an increased 
like um, involvement in activities. I don't want to phrase this. I'm trying to think of how to shorten it. Um, with a high potential for painful consequences. Activities with a high potential for painful consequences. People tend to do reckless and impulsive behaviors when they are in a manic episode. Maybe you go on a shopping spree and you spend a bunch of money that you didn't have, right? Because you just couldn't stop that impulse to buy it, right? People go out and they have multiple like partners on protected sex and get into themselves into trouble that way. It might be drug use. It could be anything that like has um, a high potential for painful consequences. Sometimes people pick fights or they get really aggressive um, in these up agitated states. Sometimes people will also hallucinate. It's not super common, but people can have such severe uh, manic episodes that they actually hallucinate and see things that aren't there, right? So the idea with this is it's a very up agitated state where you have a lot of poor judgment, poor planning, you engage in things that have a high risk of like consequences, oftentimes very like impulsive, reckless sort of behavior. You're not sleeping, you have this like pressure to talk and to do things and to keep moving. It's a very like uncomfortable, agitated state. And it only has to last a week, but that week can bring a lot of consequences with it. And, and I have an example of this and then we could talk about it a little bit more. Um, if you've seen the movie Silver Linings Playbook, right? The main character has bipolar disorder, and um, there was a scene in there that's a good example of like a manic episode. Um, notice the time of day, notice his like pressure, his tapping, his movement, some of his kind of poor like judgment and um, angry behavior. Uh, I think it's a pretty decent example. Some like violence or it can be just like reckless, impulsive kind of stuff. But when people are in a manic episode, they tend to get themselves into trouble a little bit. It can be very, very uh, destructive and disruptive. And when they cycle back to depression, right, it can feel like very different people. It can almost feel like two different people when somebody has this disorder. And oftentimes you get this like, which version of this person am I going to get today? Right. Uh, I grew up with a mom who had bipolar disorder and it was always like, which mom am I going to get? Am I going to get the mom that never wants to get out of bed, has a lot of depression? I can't do anything. I'm worthless and that side of it. Or am I going to get the mom who won't go to bed? I won't stop talking. I can accomplish anything. I can do anything like up and agitated, right? And so it can feel like two very, very different people, especially when people are alternating between the up and the down. Um, it can be a difficult disorder. It's one of the typically more stigmatized disorders, along with a, a couple others that we'll, we haven't gotten to yet. But uh, any like stories or comments or questions about like manic episodes? Anyone know? Somebody who's been in one or like any any thoughts at all? Monday morning, I'm on the camera. Yeah. It can last months. I mean, but typically it's much shorter than depression, right? Because this is hard to maintain. What happens eventually is your body kind of crashes. So typically what we see is like two to three weeks at the most. Some people are what we call rapid cyclers. Right. And what that means is they go through these like episodes much quicker than the average person. But like two weeks is usually yeah. like the most common like point where people start to come out of it just because it's exhausting. Your body starts to get worn down. And it's funny. Um, I forget who I was talking to about this. It was this little it was one of the girls on like one of my softball teams. She called someone bipolar the other day, right? And she's 10, right? And I was like, what do you know about bipolar, right? Like, it was the funniest thing. This girl was like really, really up and like really happy and doing great. And then like two minutes later, like super sad. And like, you've ever seen somebody have like the laugh cries where they're like, they're crying or laughing so hard, they start crying and crash. Oftentimes people will think that's very bipolar-like, but it's very different. Our mood sometimes when it goes all the way up will naturally come all the way down. Right? It's just a very chemical thing that can happen. With this, this is a much longer thing. It's not a short-lived experience. You have a longer manic episode and then a longer uh, depressive episode. So a little different than kind of the way I think we tend to think this can manifest. And I think I mentioned this before too. We used to call this manic depression, 
manic depression for good reason, right? Manic episode, depressive episode, manic depression. But in the last like 20 years, we have changed it to bipolar disorder because we've noticed that there are different levels of mania, right? People can have a manic episode or they can have what's called hypomania. Hypomania or like a hypomanic episode is like mania light. It's all of this stuff, but not nearly as severe. People who have hypomanic episodes can sometimes be incredibly productive. Hypomanic episodes, it's all of this, but not as severe, right? So you have this like increased drive and self-esteem and energy and you're not sleeping. And sometimes artists are able to harness that in a way that's really productive and really like quite amazing. Manic episodes are almost never that way. But the difference between these two is only in the mania. So bipolar one is the more severe of the two. When people have bipolar one, they have full-blown manic episodes and full-blown major depressive episodes. Think of it as like number one, right? It's the most severe, right? It's, it's like the most severe of the two. Bipolar two, you still have the major depressive episodes. The depression's the same, but people have what are called hypomanic episodes instead. So bipolar two is less destructive, right? Though people still have the low end of mood. And just like we talked about with depression, there is another one called cyclothymic disorder. This one is when people have very low grade mania and very low grade depression over a long period of time, right? Over a very long stretch. So two years for this one. And it's really commonly missed because it might just be mistaken for personality right, like ups and downs that are a little bit milder, people tend to have this under control a little more, um, but it is kind of a longer lasting, lower grade version of bipolar disorder. And I oftentimes have people send me songs. I have two songs for you today. I'll play one of them right now. But um, somebody sent me the song and it's an older song. It's a Matchbox 20 song, right? So it's definitely older. Um, it remind me of like back when I was like in school. Uh, but there was a song that came out from this artist is called Unwell. And the whole song is about his battle with bipolar disorder. Right. And he talks of like in the lyrics, there's a lot of stuff of like, I'm not crazy, like wait for the other side of me to come up. Um, so I'll play it for you along with the video. I think it's a really good like depiction by an artist of what it can look like to have this disorder, kind of other sides of you coming up, like wait a while and then you'll see another side of me is a lyric that he repeats that's very typical of someone with this disorder. So very much about that, right? Again, that like stay a while and then you'll see a different side of me kind of cycling back and forth between the two. Um, and, you know, somebody once said like in my class, the one who uh, turned it into me was like, he must have cyclothymic disorder. He's like, I'm not crazy. I'm just a little unwell. So he had this, right? Low grade. Um, Hard to say, right? But a lot of people who are very like artistic um, are able to sometimes harness these, like people who have this disorder and are very artistic. Like there are very, a lot of famous painters and things who have bipolar disorder, or bipolar two most likely. Bipolar one is very disruptive. Bipolar two can actually be somewhat productive if you're able to harness those hypomanic episodes. So again, one's more severe, one's a little milder, and this one's like long lasting, like lower grade ups and downs. But with this disorder, uh, as I mentioned, like a very stigmatized, right? bipolar disorder is very misunderstood, very stigmatized. Uh, I would say borderline personality disorder is one of the other really uh, stigmatized ones. And we'll get to that in chapter 13. Causes are often a little bit similar. Right, so some similar causes to depression, which you would expect because depression is part of bipolar disorder. So neurotransmitters, we have the same ones that are culprits, but here it can be underactivity or overactivity. Right? Sometimes when people take antidepressants, it causes a manic episode because they get too much norepinephrine and serotonin and dopamine, right? So again, it's that balance of like, you can't have too much of it. You have to have just the right amount. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, but um, they didn't know what it was. Yeah. Like, yeah. What did Crazy look like for her? Like, or that, I mean, for her, I don't know what I've seen. Yeah. Okay. But she was. 
had very controlling ways. I was her best friend in the university, but I was like a good friend to her, even though it was very much that too. So she had like, time and location, she was always checking in my hand, and then like, just assume all these really bad things, and then something happened to her, and then she was like, I was like, I was like, Herself over it, or I think it's just like I don't know, it's just crazy. Okay. So I wonder if, like, her person was oh, I never, true. I never understood what was going on. And it's interesting, like, I only really have this much of a picture, right? But it sounds so much more like borderline personality mm -hmm. disorder, which is really commonly confused with bipolar. Mm -hmm. Like, they tend to go, uh, hand in hand or like to be used a lot. Yeah. And the reason I say that is it tends to revolve around relationships. Mm -hmm. um, relationship is a really tricky, like with bipolar, of course, as well, but a borderline especially, yeah. where it's this constant like push and pull and you mentioned of like, almost like seeing you way more closely than you actually are. I and mean, any little thing can like absolutely ruin the relationship. Yeah. Very typical of PDD or borderline. Oh, yeah, and then, but the OCD has like controlling elements to it as well, which could be where some of that came from. But I mean, it, it can be just so hard as a friend, as a partner, as a family member, as a child, like whatever it is, it makes it difficult to navigate. Yeah, like if I, I don't know if there is, she would be like, you can't be doing that, you have to study, you know, all this kind of stuff. I was like, uh -huh. you're like, what about yourself? Yeah, I was like, <laughs> Yeah, uh, and there tend to be, uh, again, the ups and downs is what makes it so hard. You just oftentimes don't know which version of this person you're going to get. Yeah. And the person struggling with this, I mean, so difficult as well, right? Like, just your mood is all over the place. Very hard to see beyond the current episode that you're in. Um, it's super challenging, right? Again, anyone else? Anyone else know? Like, people, any other comments or stories? People in your life? Yeah. Sure, question mark. They aren't always, right? But sometimes what happens is people have lost control with mm -hmm. bipolar disorder, right? You feel out of control. And so what that does is it causes an anxiety that you then grasp for control. And that can sometimes come up as like OCD kind of things. So like, I feel out of control of my mood. So I'm going to do these things for the <clears throat> illusion. Like, oh, if I do this and I do this a certain way a certain number of times in this ritual, I can get control over the situation. Maybe, maybe not, right? And so sometimes, and it's not necessarily that they have to have pretty good, but you can sometimes see that people have anxiety and depression because of the lack of control that they get from being Your emotions are so out of control and you're grasping for that anxiety. Yeah. Or me, yeah, yeah. me. Uh -huh. um, I had a friend. Yeah. What can make the manic episodes all the more intense, right? And it's not uncommon for people to have more than one disorder. Like more than like two to three is pretty uncommon, but sometimes things occur together. Right, like depression and anxiety together, really common. Right, um, it it can happen that way, and it just augments. It can make those manic episodes even more severe. Yeah. How sudden will the onset of uh, manic episode be? Because I know in a lot of media will portray yeah. it going from one one room to the next, and then like all of a sudden there was you know people might get a manic episode. Yeah, that doesn't tend to be accurate. It's more of like a slow burn, right? That happens, right? And so what can happen is people kind of slowly start building and building and then they're in it right it, it's not almost never like a switch being flipped and that's how the media loves to portray it right like and i mentioned those laugh cries right because you look a little crazy and you're like laughing 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 and then you break down and cry right uh but that's so different than this this is like a very like slow progression i mean it could be a matter of hours or days um but it tends to it's not like instant like um like they portray in the media yeah Yeah. 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 So depression can be more environmental, like, or it can be biological mania. Like everything is genetic or I mean, biological, I'm sorry. I looked at genetic. Everything is biological in nature, right? It's, it's very much like a chemical imbalance. Uh, so people typically, when we have this, like you can treat it through therapy, but oftentimes people will require medication 
as well to help bring that balance back under control, right? So it's much more biological. Yeah. Yeah. And you can learn to temper the episodes through therapy, right? So therapy for this oftentimes comes in the form of like cognitive behavioral therapy or dialectical behavioral therapy. So CBT, DBT. Uh, and what they do with that, it's a lot of like fact checking. There's this thing called deer man. Deer man. Um, it's part of like a DBT practice. Right, where you have to, uh, and I'm forgetting what they stand for, like you describe, explain, like analyze, like it's, you come up with like something that happened and then you have to break it down into its pieces and respond in a more effective way. So you can learn to temper it and check the facts um, through therapy, but the underlying problem might not go away, right? Um, and so it tends to be a little like more typically needing medication not always, but people can manage it on their own, but oftentimes medications help, which we'll get to on the next slide. So neurotransmitters, huge culprit, right? So in depression, they were just underactive. They can be overactive here, which would cause the mania, right? So kind of either end. But we also add one other piece here, which is interesting because it comes back up when we talk about treatments. Ion activity is thought to be a culprit. So if you remember when your neurons are firing, the ions are the electrical piece, those little electrically charged particles like that are inside and outside of a neuron, they change concentration causing a cell to fire or a neuron to fire. They either are thought to fire too easily or too stubbornly representing the ends of the bipolar spectrum. So one of the treatments for bipolar disorder very much builds on that idea, which we'll get to on the next slide. There are some brain structures that we see playing a role, though it's a little more like correlation based rather than cause. It's hard to know if they cause it or if they're off because of the disorder. And it's very genetic, right? Depression had a 27% um, genetic piece. This includes depression. So we also have a genetic piece as well. And again, all of these are very biological in nature, right? So we see a lot of biology stuff playing a role and so the number one way to treat this is through a group of drugs called mood stabilizing drugs. When someone has bipolar disorder, they're doing this. Right up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, with like normal mood in the middle. A mood stabilizer brings the ups down and the lows up. So like you're hopefully a little less severe in your ups and downs. It stabilizes or brings the mood kind of back into a normal range. The most commonly used mood stabilizing drug is a drug called lithium. Lithium is actually a natural like mineral salt. It's on the periodic table of elements, right? If you're a science person, it's on the periodic table. It's a naturally occurring salt. Now, if we go back for one minute and remember that ion activity was thought to be one of the culprits, lithium, because it's a salt, affects your sodium levels. Sodium is one of the ions that is in charge of your uh, neurons firing. So it's thought to change the way that your cells fire, right, by changing the level of those um, like natural elements in your body. Really dangerous drug. If you have too much of it in your system, it can completely disrupt the way that your neurons fire, cause a lot of issues like seizures, Parkinsonian like shaking and tremors. Um, it can be fatal if you have too much of it. So when people are on lithium, you actually have to have blood tests every week or two um, to make sure that you don't have too much in your system. But it is by far the leading mood stabilizing drug. There's a few others, um, but this one is the most effective and it's way more effective at treating mania than depression, right? So it's common that someone will be on something like lithium to help with the mania. And then maybe they're also on something else to help with the depression side of it, right? So Again, uh, a kind of a severe medication, but it can be really helpful for people who are struggling with you know, severe bipolar disorder. Therapy, as we just said, can be helpful, but typically people need like medication if they're like in having bipolar one. Bipolar two, much more easy to manage because it's not as severe. Bipolar one, you would probably need medication. And I told you I have one other song, a couple of songs written about lithium. Evanescence wrote the best one, I would say, like in terms of like 
talking about the drug. So there's a whole song that she wrote called Lithium. And the music video is really like visually depictive as well. So I have that to play for you. Meaningful in that way. But if you take it as she's singing the whole song about this drug, you know, almost like the, the battle that people have with this drug is really like profound sometimes, right? Because as she says, like, I don't want to let it like drown me. I don't want to forget who I am. Sometimes when people take medications like mood stabilizers, it makes them feel very numb, right? Like you almost could lose a little bit of who you are, right? If you take the highs and bring them down and take the lows and bring them up, and you're always just kind of flat in the middle, sometimes people report feeling like a zombie or feeling numb or feeling like they've lost their personality, right? As much as mental illnesses can be difficult, they can come to define us, right? And so if you lose your ups and downs and you're just flat in the middle, it can lead to its own struggles. And I think she's kind of singing about like not wanting to have it like, you know, take that from her, but she needs it, right? Like I need it, I need this drug, I need it, but it also impacts me in a negative way. And that can be a battle that a lot of people have with these medications, um, especially if they're not helping them as much as they would like them to. So um, again, kind of common with this with this medication to have some of those side effects, very dangerous drug, but it can also be very, very helpful. Thank you. So again, it's, it's a bit of a battle to find the right medication or the right treatment, whether it's an antidepressant or ketamine or like a brain stimulation method or a mood stabilizer. But when people find the right one, it can be really, really helpful for them. Make a huge difference in how they deal with that depression or bipolar disorder. Uh, other questions, thoughts, comments, stories, anything else about mood disorders, bipolar, depression, anything, anything here at all? So uh, what I wanna do is take our last 10 minutes or so uh, to talk about, and I mentioned this at the beginning, I wanna talk about the second part of your paper. It's not due until Wednesday the 16th. Right? So you have some time, but I do wanna kind of put it on your mind. So this is the diagnosis paper. Part two. Okay, so it's due Wednesday 10, 16. By 1159 came up here. This one's worth 40 points. It's worth a little bit more. You have to send a little bit more effort into it here. Um, and I want to show you, sorry, and guide on the S for the S. Uh, so this one's worth 40 points. And if you go into Canvas and you click on assignments over here. All right, so you can see diagnosis paper part two is right here. All right, so let's take a look at it together for just a moment. Uh, I called this outline and source. You could also think about it as like a rough draft, but it can be in any format. What I see from a lot of people on this one is kind of a lot of bullets, like bulleted thoughts, and that's totally fine. But you need to have a couple of things. So here's the instructions. Um, you're turning in like two to three pages of progress toward your final paper. And my goal with this is to get you started on it so you don't wait and have to do all of it later. Um, if you wanted to change characters, do it before you do this part. That will make your life easier. You can still do that at any time, but I would recommend it before here. And so what a lot of people do is kind of give me a summary of the show. You can start giving me ideas or thoughts about your character. Maybe you have bulleted thoughts about like, bless you, about scenes in the movie or the show that might be good examples for your paper. Or maybe you have some bulleted thoughts about like disorders that they might have, but you haven't narrowed it down yet and that's okay. Uh, the other thing that you'll need is a source that you're gonna use to help you write the paper. Now for the final paper, bless you again, you only need one source. But you, I want you to get one here. You need a source plus like an outline. And it's roughly like two to three pages. Now, every single one of you for your source could use the DSM, right? It's a great source. It's going to have all the criteria for whatever disorder or disorders you're using. It can be a journal article. It can be a book. It just can't be our textbook or something non-academic. And so to help you with that, um, our librarian helped record a little thing a couple of years ago for me during COVID, um, and it's under modules. 
if you go all the way down underneath all of the recordings of our class, it's right here. There's a library resources video, an APA resources video. And this will be really helpful if you want to find something online or you don't understand the difference between academic and non-academic sources. Um, our librarian went over all of that here. Um, so I just want to point that out as a great resource for you. If you scroll up, there's also a bunch of other resources that might be helpful as you're thinking about this paper. I have some sample papers here that might be helpful if you want to see what other people did. This is for the final paper, but still. There's some stuff from the Writing Center um, and then some library resources, including the DSM. So there's some stuff up here that might be really helpful on our Canvas page. But mainly, if you go back um, to assignments, you can find the instructions for it right here at the top. And you are turning it in on here, just like you did with part one. But I want you to start thinking about it. Again, it should be a few pages. I should see progress toward that final paper. Biggest thing, right off the bat, I'm going to look for a source. Okay, if you don't have a source, you'll lose 10 points right off the bat of the 40. So it's worth a lot of points. Again, the DSM will work, but you need to have all the citation information for your source. And some of those handouts tell you exactly how to cite the DSM, how to do all those things like really easily. So they're going to be helpful for you. But a lot of people's papers kind of look like this. Like maybe they write the summary and then they have some blended thoughts like after that and then their source. So more than the formatting, I'm just looking for content. I'm looking to see that you've made progress toward that final paper, that you've come up with an academic source, that maybe you have some thoughts about a diagnosis or two or three, you haven't narrowed it down yet, that's okay. But this is due on the 16th. So start thinking about it. Remember that there's lots of resources here if you click on modules, from sample papers to library resources, and then all the way down, remember, is that library video that might be really helpful for you. Right? Yeah. No. Yeah, the second one. Right. So the whole point of the paper is to diagnose like the character. So what people typically do, and if you look at some of the samples that are there, people typically have like a paragraph or two for their summary. So describe like the show or the character a little bit, and then you'll have a character description. And then you jump into like, this is what I think they have. The bulk of your paper is writing about what disorder you think they have, giving me examples from the show to support it and covering the criteria for that disorder. So try and pick just one, maybe two disorders. If you do more than that, it's just gonna to be too big. Um, but yeah, and if you look at these again, you can kind of see like, so let's pick, this person did Captain Hook, which I thought was kind of fun. Um, but if you look at like this final paper, for example, if it decides to load, we'll wait impatiently. I'm always so impatient with it. I'm like, come on, load. Um, Look at this beautiful paper right here. No, it's good. So they have a cover page, and we'll talk about that part later. But their summary, right? So they have like a one, uh, two paragraph summary, and then they start talking about the character, and then it's diagnosing him after that, right? And that's kind of what most of the papers follow that format. So I would definitely recommend if you're feeling overwhelmed, read through some of, or at least just look over some of the sample papers. You can get an idea of what other people did. Um, and I usually ask for like one or two each semester. And and add them just so you can see all these got A's. Um, most people do really well in this paper. I think it's as long as you pick a character you're interested in, that will help, right? Because then you're going to spend some time thinking about them. Yeah. This is more of the ideas. Yeah. How many pages is the The actual final paper, I think, is five to six pages, right? So what I'm looking here, and again, I don't care about the format so much. A lot of people, it's bullets, and that's fine for this part of the paper. The final paper will be like a composed written paper. Yeah. Are there any other questions about this one for now? Um, um, I can, if you think of a question, we have Wednesday and Monday and even Wednesday next week, but I wanted it to put it on your mind so that you start working on it. You can turn it in whenever you have it done. It's already open, um, but it's due Wednesday the 16th before midnight. All right, so um, what we'll do from here is on Wednesday, if I hear back from the QPR people that are going to come in, I'll let you know, just because that is a sensitive topic, and I want you to know before you come in for that. Um, otherwise, we'll plan on our next chapter is chapter nine, which is eating disorders. So uh, we'll stop there. I'll see you all on Wednesday. Oh, and I remembered what dear man, I wrote down what it stood for in case you were curious. I'm not going to ask you, but just in case you wanted to know.
Thank you. Bye. Take care.